preview. Well, McLaurin, here we are. It's our first video Sunday. We are thrilled that you're able to join us online. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching our first video for the first week of this incredible time that we're in. I want to say before we get started that uh, the video is a bit rushed this week given the circumstances. Please continue to journey on with us. The production quality will only improve and um, yeah, we have some opportunities to do some neat things in this format that we haven't really been able to do before. So it's kind of cool. Uh, I know that uh, as we were recording, it was a lot of fun and a bit different preaching and doing announcements in front of a camera instead of on a stage. Peter did give me a lot of really tempting outtakes that I just couldn't quite bring myself to sneak into the end of the video. We still do have to stay focused after all. Before we get going, I want to remind you that if you or anyone you know is having trouble getting connected to our community um, through Facebook, through YouTube, or through the website, any technical issues at all, we have people who are ready and willing to help get that sorted out. So please contact the office uh, and we will send someone to help. Uh, the contact information for the office will be uh, shown several times during this video, so uh, you can you'll you'll know how to get connected, and it'll be really good. Um, before we get going, and we hit up Gavin for our announcements, I just want to. I had a really powerful thought this morning, that at the beginning of this year, we closed off. Well, we closed off 2019, saying, "God, thank you for all that you have done," and honoring God for His presence in our midst. And we started off 2020 with a bunch of prayers and a heartfelt cry and the question of what are you, what do you have and what are you willing to give? But one of the prayers that we prayed, Peter and I stood on that stage and we said, Lord, we want to be more fruitful in 2020 than we have ever been before. That's a big prayer. And we are in some big times. And God is going to do through us as we abide in him more than we could ask or imagine and we will be fruitful in ways that we never have been before and I don't know about you but already I am super encouraged by what I'm seeing from our community across all the ages across all the demographics people are connecting people are reaching out and we are binding we are being bound together in new ways and we're discovering that while we've met in this building for years Sunday after Sunday we are the building we are the church I am so encouraged to be on this journey with you. I'm so honored to be a part of such an awesome staff and uh, an overseer team here at McLaurin. Uh, I hope you're blessed by these videos. Please send your comments and send your feedback. We want to make these great 
video experiences for you. Uh, and with all of that said, let's help go to Gavin for announcements. Good morning, everyone. I do hope you are well and in good health. I thought it would be nice to have a change in scenery and marvel at the beauty of our Alberta blue skies. As you may already suspect, there's not a significant amount of announcements to relay, as most of our programs have been suspended. Some things to note, though. The church will not be open on Monday, as it usually is. Wendy will be instead working Tuesday to Friday as everything has slowed down. Cobb's Bakery, however, still continues to bake bread steadily and has supplied us with ample amounts of bread. So please stop by the church after Monday and make your pickups. If you aren't able to make it in, we can schedule a drop-off with other supplies if needed. Please contact the church via phone or email of your needs and we will make arrangements with someone to make that drop off for you. So I encourage you to continue to help your church family in addition to your immediate family. The best means of giving is either through e-transfer at this address. Donate NBC Gateway at gmail.com or preferably automatic withdrawals which can be set up if you contact us. If neither are an option, the church will be open Tuesday through Friday where you are free to drop off your envelopes in the donation box. So before we jump in or into prayer, um, I just thank you and I encourage you all to be strong and continue. So let's pray. Father Lord, we just give thanks. We give thanks for your grace, your mercy and love that endures forever. Your steadfast love endures forever, Father. And so may we be mindful that you are sovereign over all things and that you ordain all things to be even the trials and tribulations that we were struggling with right now these are things that have been um, ordained by you and so god all that you do is good and just and so we we should be mindful of that i pray god that that you would help us also be patient that this is temporary and that um, this virus that has plagued us all, that it would soon dissipate. And may you be blessed and honored, Father, in all things. In your holy name, Jesus, we pray. It's Jesus' performance that is transferred to my account when I receive him by faith. That's why Paul labors the point that our justification is given to us freely as a gift of the Father. That God calls me just before he makes me just.
Hey folks, welcome to McLaurin Minute. Today we're going to look at Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. Uh, the context is the religious, one of the religious leaders is asking Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And here is Jesus' response. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Then Jesus saw that he had answered wisely. He said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dare ask him, Jesus, any more questions. May the Lord bless this reading of his word. What I find amazing about that story is that we can bring to Jesus all of our questions and concerns and he doesn't turn us away. And in, during this season of life, I know that we have, have lots of questions. We have lots of concerns. There's, there's thoughts and racing through our heads about what's kind of going on and what's the next thing. And yet, what encourages me most about that passage is that there is times when we need to lay aside all of our thoughts and all of our concerns and just enter into the presence of God that we don't need to ask any more questions. Psalm 46 verse 10 says, be still and know that I am God. And I think that's a great word for today that we can just be still and know that God is sovereign, God has all things under control, that we can rest in the finished work of Jesus. We know that death has no sting. We know that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, ruling and reigning. We know that he is creator and sustainer of all things. We can be still and know that he is God. That's life at McLaurin. Thanks for joining us for a McLaurin Minute. Amen. Saul was one of the witnesses and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. And all the believers except the, uh, except the apostles were scattered through regions of Judah and Samaria. Some devout men came and buried, buried Stephen with great mourning. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women and to throw them into prison. But the believers who were scattered preached God the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example, 
went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. Crowds listened intently to Philip to because they were eager to hear his message and see the curious signs he did. Many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left their victims, and many men who had, who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Alrighty, welcome to McLaurin Online. This week we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 8. And as a congregation, we've been going through the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is really like the birth of the church. The Holy Spirit poured out upon his people. And what happens is that the church, the people of God, grow. And there's this amazing growth and explosion of the church. And yet, alongside of it is this great persecution that there is difficulty. And we come to these pivotal chapters in chapter 6, 7, and 8, where one of their leaders, Stephen, is killed for proclaiming the gospel. And we have to ask the question, what happens next? What is this aftermath? Because how is the church going to react to unimaginable difficulty? That difficulty is that one of their leaders has been killed. And the question is, now what? You know, will the church survive, right? Right at the first verse, we tell that Saul approved the killing of Stephen, but he didn't stop there. He continues. There's great persecution. They're scattered. They're, they're, he's, he's bent on destroying the church. He goes from house to house. He's dragged off and imprisoned. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a second. But this is where I want to land for us because this is just amazing. Those who have been scattered preach the word wherever they went. Wherever they went, they were the church. They were being the church wherever, however, and whatever. Whether they were homeless, whether they were jobless, whether they were imprisoned, whether they were displaced, Jesus is enough, and God was with them. And I think this story is uh, as a calling. It's the, it's, Luke wrote this down for us in order to encourage us during those times of difficulty. And I think I see that. I want to just kind of rewind. And I think I see a little bit of that, even in, G in Stephen's death, in his speech to the Jewish leaders. I love that. His speech could be summarized by his opening line and his closing line. His opening line is, the God of glory appeared and you resisted the Holy Spirit. The God of glory appeared. How did God of glory appear? God of glory appeared in his promises and you doubted them. God of glory appeared when he fulfilled those promises and you took credit, the religious leaders, and made idols. The God of glory appeared and he sent prophets and leaders and you rejected them and you killed them. And that's what you did to Jesus. The God of glory appeared by sending his own son to live the life we couldn't live and die the death that we deserve. And you resisted. And you killed him. But the big idea around all of that is that the God of glory appeared. And I think the church, the people of God, knew that. That God was with them. That God is with us, right? That if God is with us, who can be against us? That's Stephen's story. And, and I think this story is written so that it, it, it would somehow get it into our bones, I guess, for lack of a better way of putting it. That we are God's people and God is with us. That, that was God's, that was Stephen's story, right? Remember when he's being stoned, it said that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he looked up, and what did he see? He saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And I think that's an amazing thing. Like, that's the only time we ever see or ever read that Jesus is standing at the right hand of God. I think he's encouraging, welcoming Stephen home. Well done, my good and faithful servant. But that's Stephen's story. What about the church? How will the church respond? And that's Acts chapter 
8. But before we get to Acts chapter 8, I think we have to go back to Acts chapter 5 because I think Acts chapter 5 sets the stage. It makes, it, it shows us just how stunning and how profound the book of, you know, the ch- chapter 8 truly is. I think it's a, it, it, you have to read it in light of Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5 is where the last time the disciples and the apostles are arrested. It says that the high priest and their associates, filled with jealousy. So this isn't about right or wrong. It's about them being jealous. It's about them feeling like uh, the disciples and the apostles are more popular. They have more influence. Or maybe they're being exposed for their phonies and their, you know, uh, they're, 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 they're being exposed as fakes. Because here's the reality. The disciples are telling people about this new life. And I want to kind of double down on this or triple down on this, right? Like the disciples continue to proclaim this new life. That the gospel was not some sort of theology and up there. It wasn't about do's or don'ts. It was about this new life that Jesus was with them. That they knew that Jesus was with them. That they were experiencing this. That they tasted what it meant that God was with them. This Holy Spirit, God coming down upon them. And what I really like about this story, and just as a quick aside again, is that the angel of the Lord appeared, they were let out of jail, and then they were told to go back to the temple courts to proclaim the gospel. It kind of feels like they go on, went full circle. Like this is, what, this is how they got into jail, by proclaiming the gospel in the temple courts. But I think that, that's really a foreshadowing of Acts chapter 8. Let's keep going. It says that, they brought them before the Sanhedrin. And they, they remind them, we gave you strict orders not to teach. There's going to be consequences. There's going to be consequences. Why? Because you are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Once again, it's all about them and their image. And they don't want to look bad. I love the, the apostles' response. We must obey God rather than human beings. Why? Because we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. Once again, you know, it's this courage and confidence in the presence of God for these disciples. I love that. But this is where it kind of gets interesting. They the religious leaders don't know what to do. So they basically send the disciples uh, away for a little while. And they're kind of like deliberating, like, what are we going to do? And, and when they say, what are we going to do? Gamaliel stands up. Gamaliel is a, as a Pharisee. He is uh, a teacher of the law. He is respected in the council, the Sanhedrin. And he stands up and he says, you know what, guys? We've seen this before. We've seen this before. There was this fellow named Theodos, right? He rallied a bunch of people, but he was killed and all his followers were dispersed. And we've seen this again in this fellow named Judas. And he was appeared and he said he was something. He was leading a band of people. And he too was killed. And his followers scattered. He's basically saying, there's a pattern to all of this. Let's just apply some heat. Eventually, one of their leaders gets killed. And the movement dies. Apply heat. Kill the leader. The movement dies. And we're going to be putting that. I think Acts chapter 8 is basically putting that to the test. The story in Acts chapter 5 ends by, say, by Gamaliel saying, You know what? Leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purposes or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it's from God, you're not able to stop these men. And you'll only find yourself fighting against God. Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8 is putting Gamaliel's theory to the test. In Acts chapter 6 and 7, we see the death of Stephen. And then it doesn't stop from there. It says that after that, on that day, what day is it? The day that Stephen is killed, a great persecution broke out. And all except the apostles were scattered. I want you to hold on to that for a second because I think that's really important. All except the apostles were scattered. The church is scattered. The apostles were not. 
and Saul began to destroy the church, meaning he's going to tear it down. And he's going from house to house, dragged off both men and women, and put them into prison. Let's take a look at this for a second. He went from house to house. I think there's a few implications that it means. One, it's not the temple. It's not the temple. They've been pushed out of the temple. Now it's from house to house. But on top of that, the church, the temple was where God dwelled. That God no longer dwells in the temple. God dwells in his new temple, the people of God. And two, house to house meant Paul was thorough. He was determined to bring an end to the church. And so he's going from house to house. He's not letting any stone be unturned. He's kind of, kind of dragging all of the, the Christians and throwing them into prison. He wants to destroy this. And further, going from house to house should remind us of Acts chapter 2 and what the church looked like and what the church was all about. It should bring up memories of when the Spirit poured down upon the people. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching a fellowship and breaking bread in their homes. And they prayed and they were ridiculously generous and they never stopped meeting together. No temple, no house, doesn't matter if it was in prison, whether or not they were scattered, they never stopped being the church. They shared their lives. They continued to devote themselves to being the church. I think that's Amazing, because here's what happens. The result is, the church is stronger than ever. And it says that the church is physically fractured, but clearly not spiritually flat factored, fractured. I think that's, some, that's like amazing. They proclaimed and became the church wherever they found themselves. Think about that. Think about that. What does it mean to be scattered? What was it like? And the first thing was, not the apostles. This was the church being the church. The church is growing, not because of the, uh, the apostles. They're, they're growing because the church is the church. That's amazing. That everywhere they went, they carried the Holy Spirit with them. That they were the church. That, 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 that if I may put it this way, they were distressed and yet willing. And what I, what I may put it this way is that, that the more unstable they were, Physically, the more the Holy Spirit stabilized them. That they were homeless. They were jobless. They were beaten. They were imprisoned. They lost property. They lost family. They lost lifestyles. They were displaced. And yet there was joy. It says that in verse 8, that wherever they proclaimed it, there was great joy. It was an evidence that the church could not be stopped. That's amazing. Two months ago, when I was looking through the book of Acts, this is how I would have finished this sermon. That we are the priesthood of believers. That we are the ones who proclaim new life. It's not Billy Graham, it's not Peter Maul, but it's the church being the church. And living out Acts chapter 2. And I was going to read, and I think I still will, read a little section from a lady named Rosario Butterfield. She writes this amazing book called The Gospel Comes with a House Key. And she says that this is radical, ordinary hospitality. And she's trying to live out Acts 2. And she says that this is what we're all called to do. And I want to read this as an encouragement for us. She says that radically ordinary hospitality is this. Using your Christian home in a daily way that seeks to make strangers neighbors and neighbors family of God. It brings glory to God, serves others, and lives out the gospel in word and deed. If you are prohibited from using your living space in this way, it counts if you support in some way some household in your church that's doing this. And the purpose of radically ordinary hospitality is to build focus deepen, strengthen the family of God, pointing others to Bible-believing local church and being earthly and spiritual good to everyone we know. When our Christian homes are open, we make transparent to the watching world what Christ is doing in our bodies, 
our families, in our world. When we daily gather with family of God in organic and open communal ways and invite those who don't yet know Jesus to enter, we accompany one another in suffering. We bear one another's burdens. We show a watching world what fervent prayer sounds like, talking to God, knowing that we, through the merits of Christ, are on good terms with Him, and that our daily needs are His concern. When a Christian home is open, our unsaved neighbors watch us struggle with our own sins, both the sins of our doing and the sin nature with which we wage daily combat. For Christians to maintain an authentic Christian witness to a world that mistrusts us, at the very least, we must be transparently hospitable. I think that's the Acts 2 church. I think that's where we, sh that's where how we should continue to grow. And I was going to end by, by playing the song from Casting Crowns, Nobody. I think that's such an amazing song. I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who saved my soul. There's no one but Jesus. And that's really amazing. But that was two months ago. We face different times now, don't we? And maybe what's on our minds mostly is this COVID-19 virus. And the question, I think, that we have to wrestle with, that I think maybe the book of Acts chapter 8 pushes us to think about, is will COVID-19 end the church? In the last month or so, I think this has brought the world to a halt. We're in a state of emergency. Economies are crashing. You know, schools are closed. Um, public places are closed. Churches are closed. Mega cities are quarantined. Borders are closed. Um, there's widespread panic. It's hard not to be afraid. I had a good friend call me the other day and just ask, how are you doing? And I said, you know what, honestly, I kind of fluctuate. I fluctuate one morning, I'm saying, I feel like I'm okay. And the next morning, I'm like, I have to admit, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm a little bit overwhelmed. And in these times, I think sometimes it's such a, so hard to embrace Jesus' words. Remember in John chapter 14, verse 27, he says, My peace I give you. I don't give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not let them be afraid. It's hard to embrace those things. We're kind of walking into uncharted um, territory. Our journey seems so unfamiliar. It's bizarre at times. Like, can anyone explain to me why we need to hoard toilet paper? Uh, forget, don't, don't even go there. Uh, and yet, I kind of feel like today's passage, Acts chapter 8, is so profound. The big idea is that God is with us, and we need each other, and we are the church. It's echoing Jesus' words. In this world, there will be trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And what Acts chapter 8, what we see in Acts chapter 8, is his people overcoming the world. Social distancing doesn't equal isolation. Acts chapter 8, we see the people of God being displaced, dispersed, that didn't stop them from being the people of God. They lost houses. They lost property. They were displaced. They lost jobs. They probably lost family. They were scattered. And that didn't stop them from being God's people. They knew one thing, that God was with them. The God of glory appeared. No one is greater than Jesus. Jesus says, all power and authority has been given to me, and I give that to you. In Colossians, it says that all things, all things were made by him and for him. And he knows every hair on our heads. He knows. And if that's not enough, death could not hold him. And he invites us to examine his nail-scarred hands and feet. Death comes. 
But he says, I am the only one who can overcome death. And what the Father did for me, I'll do for you. Christ in me, the hope of glory. And his perfect love drives out perfect fear. I don't think the church is... I don't think the church is a stranger to all of this. If you look at church history, it's one of the things that made the church the church. That the church was no stranger to plagues and epidemics and mass hysteria. In fact, the first church, according to Christian and non-Christian accounts, grew because of how the Christians responded to disease and suffering and death. It was the reason why the church exploded in growth. The way the church responded in love and care made such an impression on the Roman Empire that even the pagan Roman emperors took notice and they would kind of criticize the pagan religions and say, why aren't you more like the Christians? It's noted that in 249, a plague swept across Rome. And at the height of the plague, it says that more than 5,000 died each day. That's crazy. And what they saw was the difference between those who knew Christ and those who didn't know Christ. Those who didn't know Christ kind of, kind of like retreated in self-preservation hoarding toilet paper or something like that. They fled and abandoned their sick and loved ones. Let me read what they, what they saw, what they saw of those who didn't know Christ. At first onset of the disease, they pushed the sufferers away and fled from their dearest, throwing them into the roads before they were dead and treating unburied corpse as dirt, hoping thereby to avert the spread of the disease. But what they saw of those who followed Christ was fearless, sacrificial service. They saw Christians running to the front line, marching into the epidemic and serving both Christians and non-Christians. And it was those moments in which the church grew stronger and the church just grew. I think we're at the same spot. How do we bring that posture into practice. I think we have to take seriously all the one another's in the book, in the Bible, that we're to love one another, devote to one another, carry one another's burdens, to serve one another, to encourage one another, to rejoice with those who are rejoicing and grieve with those who grieve. How do we bring this posture into practice? We keep our eyes focused on Jesus because that's what Jesus did for us. And we, uh, we keep our eyes on Jesus because we know He is Lord and Savior, that He has all power and all authority. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is not surprised by the virus. He knew where it started. He knows where it's going. He knows, and He is the one that holds the church together. And when we keep our eyes on Jesus, we ask the Holy Spirit to write those things deeper into our hearts. We also take heed of Hebrews 10.25. It says that, Do not stop meeting together as some have made it a habit of. It is harder. But it says, Encourage one another because the day is coming. Maybe this is some of those days. And when we need each other, we need to resist fear. The natural inclination is to be fearful. But God said, my peace I give with you. And that God is bigger. God is bigger. And we need one another to remind ourselves of that. I'm so thankful for the so many of you who checked in with me. This week I had a number of calls, number of emails that said, hey, Peter, how are you doing? And I'm so encouraged by all of the stories from many of you that this will not stop us from being church. I heard stories of many of you when they heard about the state of emergency and that we're social distancing. Many of you called out 
to your friends, your family, Christians and non-Christians, to neighbors and co-workers and said, how are you doing? Can we help? Can we come alongside in some way? I heard this week, Women to Women, which is our kind of women's group on Tuesday mornings, we could, they couldn't meet and they set up a Facebook messenger site to pray for one another. Because just because they couldn't be face to face, it didn't stop them from being the people of God and praying for one another. I think that's amazing. We had a number of calls of people coming and stepping forward and said, you know what, we can help shop for people. We can help make meals. And here at the church, we want to stay open and connected. And we're going to do that in three, different, three ways. We're going to continue our email uh, correspondence. We're going to continue to update our website. And we opened a new Life Here at McLaurin Facebook page. We're open to suggestions. This is kind of all new to us, right? There, there's probably going to be times when we're like a little frustrated or a little lonely. We need to continue to connect and be the people of God. And the office will continue to remain open during the mornings. I think it will be probably Tuesday to Friday. Caleb, I'm so encouraged by Caleb. He's reaching out to families that are involved in Sunday school and Awana and youth, and he wants to, to, to resource you. The leadership here is going to be in the next week making phone calls to as many of you as possible in order to check in, encourage, and pray with you. If you're not sure... If we have your contact information, just phone the office. Or if we haven't touched base with you, or somebody here hasn't touched base with you in the next two weeks, call us and tell us your contact information. I think all of this, just as it was in Acts chapter 8, is forcing us to be the church. Not just go to church, but be the church. Is church really just Sunday morning? No, I, I think church is way more than that. It's calling us to pray for one another. It's calling us to encourage one another. It's calling us to maybe devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching. Maybe it's to, to having a little bit more time in our Bible readings and learning and growing with God. Maybe it's that more time of like, you know what, breaking bread in our families. We have more time with, for our families. We have no excuse. Maybe. Maybe it's a bit of a gift from God to take a breath, to reconsider what it is to be the people of God. And I know, just like the Acts Church, there will be some bumps and there may be some serious bruises along the way. But I think this is an opportunity for us to be the church, be the people of God, I want to leave you with this. This is Jesus' words to us. I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Jesus won't abandon us. Jesus is with us. And I want to see that. And I want to, like, when I think about the gates of Hades, the gates are not an offensive weapon. The gates are a defensive weapon. That means... That Jesus and the church is on the offensive. You are. I am the church. Yes, there may be fears. Yes, we may be displaced. But God has not abandoned us. We are the church. In this world, there will be trouble. Take heart. But I, for I have overcome the world. We are God's people. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you. We praise you for just reminding us that you will never abandon us. You will never forsake us. And yes, there, we may have some fears and we may have some concerns. And yes, we may feel like we're displaced. But we are never far from you. And I pray, Lord, that you would just write that in our hearts that the God of glory appeared. And that makes all the difference. That death has no sting, that we have a place with you, that Lord, our lives are hidden. It says that our lives are hidden in you. And your love will drive out our fears. 
And so, Lord, during this time, I pray that we would just keep our eyes focused upon you, Lord. That we wouldn't be a people that give ourselves to fear. That we would be a people who encourage, who pray, who know, Lord, that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Thank you, God. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. Just want to thank you for joining us for McLaurin Live online. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, just shoot us a message or shoot us an email. Further, as we continue to go through the book of Acts, we want this to be a lot more of an interactive uh, experience. Since we can't do this face-to-face, -face, send us any questions you might have about Acts or about what you've just heard. Caleb and I, further, will likely be doing living in the scriptures live sometime during this week. So send us your questions and send us your concerns and we'll kind of talk about that. Our benediction comes from Numbers chapter 6. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord's face radiate with joy because of you. May he be gracious to you, show you his favor, and give you his peace. That's a good word for us. May God bless you. Amen.